Amada mi amore mio. Amada mi amore mio. All right. Another fun edition of Deborah Cobalt Live. I love that music, and my guest, she selected it. That really put me in a great spot. I love that. Thank you for being here, Joanne Moscone Piano. Thank you. And your wonderful dad, Pietro Moscone. Thank you so much for being here. Joanne and I go way back. She actually was a teacher, an acting teacher, to my son um, at the school that they went to. My son is now in college, but when he was in middle school, uh, you taught him, and you really had a terrific relationship with him. I loved Justin. I know, and we have stayed in touch, and you do something online, and I found you online. You popped up on my Facebook. You have an online company called The Performing Arts Coach, and I'm really into people uh, branding themselves and you know, putting their businesses out there online, which is exactly what you're doing for people who cannot show up at uh, the local acting studio, or they prefer maybe what you're doing, but they can't get to you, you've got an online course, right? I do. How did you decide to do this? Well, uh, after I taught Justin, um, I don't know if you remember, I opened up my own theater in North Hollywood. I took over yeah. a theater called the Avery Schreiber Theater. We renamed it the Avery Schreiber Playhouse, and within that theater, I had my own theater called the Magic Mirror Theater. And unfortunately, because of life circumstances, I wanted to go to New York City. To Not take care of Papa. Fortunately. Uh, Papa got a little sick, right? So Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's better now, though. And I wanted to write his cookbook, uh, which we'll get to. I decided to be bi-coastal and live half the time in New York, which would be impossible to run a theater at the same time. So little by little, I decided how can I do what I was doing, which was live theater, and continue to, to work with kids and I started this program called the Performing Arts Coach, and it led me to work with a lot of adults that are not in L.A. or New York and don't have access to the acting schools that we have in these cities. It's opened up so much. So it's it not has. just people in New York and L.A. It's people from everywhere who are signing up for this course, correct? Can we just yes. see? You have a little video, right? A little intro that we can uh, take I a do. look? Can we, can we take a look, Tony? Okay. So people always ask me, what can I expect from working with you? This is what you can expect. Number one. A no acting approach. I don't <laughs> teach acting. I'm not interested in teaching acting. What I'm interested in is teaching being. And when you know how to fully be, that's where all the magic happens. Number two, I'm going to get you to be comfortable with what is uncomfortable. It's my job to free you up. And the way we do that is for you to start focusing on your strengths so that you can overcome some of those obstacles that have been getting in your way. Basically, we wanna get you out of your own head. Imagine if that could happen. And finally, number three, I want to provide you with a space where you feel secure to fail, succeed, learn, and most importantly, grow. That's pretty Are terrific. Are you willing we, to take this? We could take it down on? from there. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? I mean, so to be an actor, basically, you have to, you really have to step out of yourself and you cannot be self-conscious, right? I mean, if you're thinking about the character that you're trying to portray, that's where you lose it. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think the death of all acting is when you're in your head. Yeah. Even even just for public speakers or, yeah. or, or in any facet of life, but especially when you're when you're performing. So how do you teach somebody that? Because <sighs> that's hard to do because you're sitting there going, uh-oh, do I look okay? Do they like me? Am I saying my lines right? How do you just let that go? That's, that's part of the challenge. I, I think that depending on who I'm teaching, I mm -hmm. modify it accordingly because we all have different areas of insecurity and whatnot, but... One, one great little tool, I actually did this with your son, was, is repetition. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know repetition. We don't have to get into it, but it's a Meisner technique. No, I don't. Technique Tell me. Where you just repeat so that you can, you just repeat what the person says and you go over. So if I say to you, blonde hair, because you have beautiful blonde hair, you repeat blonde hair. And we keep repeating beautiful blonde it. blonde hair. Until the language doesn't matter anymore. The words don't matter. We're out of our head and we're just losing it's one of the many many little things you can do but there's there's many other stuff like relaxation exercises and just getting people to be conscious of that little voice in their head and be able to say it out loud and then tell it to shut up oh. just tell your voice to shut up once in a while and realize that th whatever the voice is saying is not necessarily true so when someone signs up for your course 
what are you teaching them? I mean, is it one-on-one -on -one or is it an actual class that you're doing? Yeah, well, it started off one-on-one, -on -one and then okay. I realized I wanted these performers to have the opportunity to work with other actors. So this is all online. I've had a kid from Barcelona, Florida, Maryland, Arizona, all in the same class. Oh, that's and I do so <laughs> cool. Yeah, um, and ma mainly improv because they can't work alone on scene since they're not in the same room and stuff. But it's been very effective. And as you know, can they see each other? I mean, they can. You it's on Zoom. That. It's one of the greatest platforms. It's uh, it's like a grid. You ever see the Brady Bunch beginning? So you, everybody sees their faces. That is And you can great. focus on one at a time. It's really, it's changed the entire world of acting because a lot of auditions now are on tape. Oh, absolutely. Have, yeah, and the cost of living in New York City and Los Angeles are so high that if you're a beginning actor who wants to get some training before you actually make that investment, online teaching is a great way to get your feet a little wet before you actually just jump into the pool of New York or LA. I would almost be more nervous to do it online because I'd be like, oh God, did I do a good job? Because I would need to sort of talk to you and read you. But um, I guess you sort of let go of that after a while, right? You get used to the fact that you're over there on the other side and we're, we're communicating. Well, there's no hiding. Yeah. And unlike acting <laughs> classes, I remember I used to be in acting classes in LA where you'd want to sleep after a while because you're watching too many scenes. Everybody's Isn't that true? It's so true. Yeah. But everybody's face is there, so there's no hiding, there's no texting, you're on. So there's no, everybody's very active in their participation. Oh, wow. So that's, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing it since October, not that long, but it's taken but off. But it's been so, a real success yeah. for you. And it allows you to go back and forth. I mean, so how often do you have a class? I took off this week because of dad, but I, I usually teach about four students a day, and then I do my classes mainly on Saturdays because I'm dealing with East and West Coast time and Central oh, right. time. So trying to find a time where I can get as many of the clients I'm working with um, together. Yeah, a lot of uh, Wednesday evenings and Saturday mornings. How do you find that you get most people? How do they hear about you? I mean, obviously online, maybe Facebook or Instagram ads, but what's been successful for you to get the word out? Believe it or not, have you heard of Thumbtack? Yeah, of course. Thumbtack was how I originally first started. and received a lot of clients and then I started promoting on Facebook and Instagram and now it's word of mouth a lot of really? referrals yeah so you just put yourself out there on thumbtack and yes. people found you and I have a big mouth so my mouth helps <laughs> yes, me <you> too <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm in a previous show we were just doing something about weight loss and about eating and manja manja and I'm thinking you know the girl in my next show I, an Italian girl nonetheless you clearly do not have that issue I mean you grew up with your dad Pietro and two of the most well-known restaurants in town owned by dad which is Via Masconi and Monty's right oh I love those restaurants in Greenwich Village aren't you yes. where are you West uh, we are uh, right in uh, almost the middle of uh, uh, Greenwich Village I love the accent you could just say anything to me and I'll just melt so I'd like to hear a little bit about Dad. So Dad inspired you to move back east for a little while to take care of him because he had a health scare. Yes. You nursed him back to health. Now he's, look, look at him, he looks so healthy. He's now coming out here to visit you. But what was it like growing up back east uh, in the heart of New York City, right there in the village, um, where Dad had two very well-known restaurants, um, right in the mecca of, you know, Broadway, off-off Broadway. What was that like for you? Well... My dad has worked a lot of hours, so as a kid, I wouldn't get to see him as much as I would have liked uh, because he worked so much. So I think that one of the things that uh, I value most in life is hard work because this man was an immigrant and started from nothing, really, came to New York City. And I, I look at New York City and what it's offered to him as a place where you really he's the American dream. He came to this country with absolutely nothing and created two uh, empires. I call them empires because they're landmarks now on McDougal Street. Yes, they are. They are incredible. Could you tell me a little bit about your story, Pietro? Where are you from in Italy? And coming here and building such a su two successful restaurants that everybody knows about. My previous guest on the other show was like, oh my God, really, that's your... So how did you do well, that? Well, what happened? Um, 1966, we came to New York, and me and my dad... Uh, took the Michelangelo ship in Genoa. We end up seven days later in the West New York and the Hudson River. And we begin from there. My, my cousin took me to her house and uh, little by little I started working in a restaurant. Never thought I would uh, last. So my first year was very tough. 
Isn't it always so? Yeah. And what inspired you from then to years later actually start your own restaurant? That's well, so tough. It, it didn't come right away. Yeah. First of all, I spent like 10 years before working all great restaurant to get enough experience. Because mm-hmm. I didn't want to fail, you know. Uh, I wanted to make it first right. And I got a little bit lucky because I think I find the right place. And uh, also my family were very willing to help. Mm-hmm. And we did a, a very good job on that because we work very hard. Can we show a little video of, of you and Dad cooking? Is this in your kitchen here in uh, California? Yes. I love this. I'm Can not even that? sure he knows. I t- oh, I think, does, did he see this yet? No, let me play this. <laughs> so when Dad is here, a meal that would have taken me about an hour to fix has taken you him seriously little, two minutes. You have a little bit of the <laughs> paprika you don't have. I do, but why are you putting breadcrumbs on the fish? Explain to the camera. Give everybody a he's cooking doing, tip. He's doing Siciliano style. But can you, can you give us a little tip of why we would wow. do that? I never learned that. Tell us. Because you keep the juice inside and you sear the fish. Oh. If you have a little good paprika, paprika it's okay. Right there, next to you. You're, you're, kind of you guys you're got. quite a director, what Joanne. Kind of well, that's all we have, the paprika. I didn't know. Are there, different, the are there different kinds? <laughs> oh, yeah. I like the Don Gallia. They say the Don so Gallia is cooking good. tip. Breadcrumbs on the bronzino before you grill it. You like cooking with your daughter? Yes. Oh. Okay, now you, <laughs> we can bring it this, down a little yep. bit. It has to be very hot. Yeah, I know. Oh, you I'm getting tears in my eyes because it really, really reminds me of having both my parents in the kitchen. Does your mom cook a lot too, or is it just dad? Um, <laughs> he's laughing. Well, you know what's funny? <laughs> in the true, true Italian culture, it's the men who do the cooking. Isn't it true? They yes. do the sauce. Uh, at least in my family, the men love to cook. I mean, the men, women did too, but the men did the hard stuff. Well, right? we have to be careful. In defense to my mother, who's watching right now, I Hi, believe, Mom. with my brother and his three grandsons. Hello. Uh, Mom's an excellent cook, but, you know, he was not the easiest critic. He's a chef, and he's from Italy. So can I do an imitation of you? A lot of times he would taste her food and say, not bad for an American, you know? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think she wants Let me to tell cook you. for him. <laughs> Let me t- I don't know if you know this. Justin wrote an essay about my parents um, fighting like dogs on Christmas morning making an apple pie. And he was cutting up the apples, and she goes, they're too big. And he's like, oh, Edith, then do it yourself. And then they just went back and forth, and I'm trying to sleep. It's like 5 in the morning, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, will they ever stop? So I go downstairs. You know, nobody's down there yet. Nobody opened up their gifts. I'm like, what are you doing? And she goes, your father's making the apples too big. And he goes, no, I'm not. Tell your mother to be quiet. This is how I grew up. The two of them really going at it in the kitchen. And I'm sure they're somewhere up there right now cooking and having a, having a good Aww. time making their meatballs. But, you know, it's a real competition when you're in there it in the is. kitchen, right? It is. You know? It and is. he still cooks in a kitchen as if he's cooking for a restaurant. Like the other night, as soon as that food was ready, he's like, come on, come on, come on, get the plates. And I'm like, wait, there's nobody to serve. It's just us. Do you know I did not get that gene? I am the only one in my family. passed right over me. Boom. I'm the only person you'll meet who actually uh, burned spaghetti. Okay, look. I need you over. Here's <laughs> the, the big the big pot. I put the spaghetti in, right? Big pe- spaghetti. And there come the flames. And my spaghetti just went, and it started to go on fire. And it was just black. And I thought, oh, no. So I had to grab the spaghetti, cut off the black part, but I didn't do such a good job. So as they're eating it, they're thinking, why is the spaghetti burned? Who burns spaghetti? I mean, they have those stories about me. How do you be an Italian girl and not be able to cook spaghetti, right? I mean, uh, seriously. Really, it's not. I'm intimidated is what it is by people like you mm. and my parents. And You shouldn't be, though, because that's you have to build confidence to be great. And really, cooking pasta is the most easiest way. Thank you. It's so easy, <laughs> honestly. I, well, you should give me a pasta lesson. I no mean, how, who, who does not know how to cook pasta? So since then, I just put the gas a little lower so that the pe- the pasta won't uh, turn over and burn. But um, I, <laughs> you're I laughing. Do, I do the opposite. <laughs> what do you do? I, I put the <laughs> gas very high. Well, that's what I did, and I burned it. I, look, I need a cooking lesson before you no go problem. home. No problem. And I'm problem. serious. Can we get a little bit into Monty's and Absolutely. Via Masconi? It's got a little bit of a history behind it, right? Yes. 
You mind telling me? Are you able to do that? It's got quite yeah. a... Um, well, Monty's restaurant has been in Greenwich Village since 1918. So next that. year, we're going to be celebrating its 100th anniversary. Joanne, I'll be there. I'm telling you, that's incredible. That would be so fun. Yeah. Right? Oh, wow. But it's got a real history sort of with some colorful characters from New York, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if any of them are watching. I hope they are because we have a lot of different ca – uh, our customers are literally the locals of New yeah. York. But then we also have – tourists from all over the world. So if you ever come into Monty's, it's like walking into Cheers in a Woody Allen type of movie. It is. We have, yeah. And we've, we've been there, and you sent me there, and your dad was there, and I was very well taken care of. It is like Cheers, and he's the man at the helm. I mean, it was just it was just an incredible, it was an incredible opportunity to go and to eat there. I felt it. Thank you. Um, but growing up there, growing up with the passion that you have uh, for acting, now you're writing a play, and it's being performed on uh, in New York City. Yes. In November. Tell me about that. So the play, we did it in Los Angeles in 2014. It did quite well. And it's called You Love That I'm Not Your Wife. It's yes. very edgy, isn't it? It's an edgy play. Give us a little bit. What's it about? Well, it's about 10 different people all living in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is a main character in this play. This play can't take place in any other city mm. because L.A. plays a major role. And for those of us who do live in L.A., and have tr I don't think you've dated in LA. You brought your husband here with you. Smart yep. girl. Smart I girl. I don't know if I could date here. And I'll <laughs> tell you, there's plenty of people, but um, I don't know if I could date now because everyone I know who are 20, 30, 40, and older, they're on the apps. And, you know, it's very, you know, I'll meet you tonight and maybe I never see you again. I don't think that would. It's not very romantic. Work is it? well for me. No, I don't think so. But, but so but, tell me about it. Okay. But the play does, um, I guess, the way La La Land did for the, oh. the city of Los Angeles didn't make it look quite so La La Land. It, there was a romantic feel to it. This play does have a lot of heart in it because it's about ten different people. They're all looking for love in all the wrong places, and they're all here in Los Angeles. Nobody comes to LA to build a family. Everybody comes to LA to succeed at something. So when you're trying to succeed at something and pursuing a dream. That's why it has a tough reputation. And I was talking about that with somebody who can't, you know, New Yorker who can't stand coming here. Uh, and I said, you know, it's, it, they're good people here. It's just yes. that by its nature, you're your own business. So you have to think of yourself and you and you and you, Tony. Everyone is thinking of themselves. You're the business. So it's a little bit of a narcissistic place because it almost has to be. Well, and know? we're old at 35 in Los Angeles. So it's, it's you know, it's a city where uh, we're, we're constantly worried about looking young. I think that's going to change. I hope so. There's so many older people now, over 35, who have money. They've got the income. They're traveling. They're cool. They're doing great stuff that a lot of people under 30 are not able to do. I they know. might think they're, like, really cool because they're hanging out late in, you know, clubs and stuff. But I did that, too. So I just think people that are older, I mean, we're not dead. You know, no. we're doing cool stuff. Look at you. You've got a bi-coastal business. Thank and, you. Uh, I've got a show, and I'm traveling all over the place. And, um, you know, I hope we can just sort of change kind that of whole Kind of change thing. it. Like, yeah. Like, I remember when in the acting business, they didn't want you to put your age on the resume. And I was like, but why? We should be proud of that. So that's something for me that. Well, I get that. Because if you're, you know, 35, but you could play 22. Correct. Psychologically, in a casting director's head, he's going to be like, wait a minute. I can't cast her. Remember, what's her name? Gabrielle from 90210. Yes. She's um, now in charge of like the SAG after and stuff. In fact, I think she's going to be coming on in a couple of weeks. Is she? she I was like her. Andrea 30. from Beverly Hills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like 30 years old and she was playing a high schooler. That totally they freaked all, me out. Yeah, they were all well, older. Especially her. She was like 30, 31. And ever since I knew that, I thought, I can't look at her the same again because, you know, I knew the age. So it's almost better to just to, to not leave it say out something. of there. You know, but um, so between that, you're working on a cookbook with dad. Yes. Right. So tell me about that. The cookbook. Well, it's called The Chef of Greenwich Village. Oh, I love that. Oh, my God. Nobody's taken that one yet? Nobody's taking it. should be a play, too. That should be your second That's play. That's the next goal. I think it could be a movie. Oh, he loves it. Look at the smile uh, on Dad's face. <laughs> and, <it's, laughs> and it features some of his best recipes, but there are so many Italian cookbooks out there, so it's not just the recipes. It's also the story of Greenwich Village itself and oh. the people who – have made my father the chef of Greenwich Village because, you know, when you're in the restaurant business, your customers are everything. And he's his customers are still consistently there for the past 41 years. He still has a lot of the same workers there for 41 years, which says a lot about him. And, uh, yeah. And again, though, you know, if you were doing this in the olden days, you would get the book out little by little 
in the neighborhood. But because we're online now, I mean, you have such a presence. Oh, thank and you. no, but I'm just saying between the acting business, the play, just getting the word out about the play, the cookbook you're doing with dad, just the opportunities, I guess, is what I'm getting at. You know, that's how we reconnected. Online. That is how we it's reconnected, great. and I think it's such a great purpose. Um, so tell people again about how they can go and, um, and find you on the performing arts coach. Like, how does it work? They have to fill out a questionnaire or what? We do a 10 minute free consultation oh. because first of all, I want to make sure that I'm the right teacher for that person yeah. as well as they're the right student for me, depending on their goals. And they could find it at the, they can find me at the performing arts Very mm -hmm. simple. I'm also all over Facebook and Instagram. Don't you also help with public speaking? Because that's a big part of people's jobs now. Um, they have to get out in front of people and talk and sell themselves. Yeah. And so that's a whole. I'm not just working with actors. That's the funny thing. I thought I was going to be working with actors. And I'm working with many actors. But some of the people that I've worked with are chefs, not just this cute chef, but other chefs. I love um, the way you talk about Lawyers, uh, uh, people who had to deliver speeches. So it's, it's really opened up what I originally thought it would be, which is what happens in business a lot. You have one idea, and then it opens up a whole new world. Joanne, what are you most passionate about? <sighs> huh, that's a good question. Um, definitely theater and writing and directing, but food. But you don't want to act. No. Why? I thought I wanted to act until I was actually acting. And first of all, I was one of those insecure people. And um, I was too. You know, yeah. I really wanted to act, and I thought, oh, that's it. But as soon as I got up there, I was like, uh, you know, I was thinking too much. It's like, oh, forget it. I was it. thinking too much. This but isn't then, for me. <laughs> but then I was watching myself thinking about how the director should yeah. direct people and how I can make the script better. And I had a director once who saw that in me and said, why don't you try directing? And I was like, but this is not what I studied. Same with my kid. I mean, he was in front of the camera and then he thought, mm, no. Justin. So now, yeah. I saw that in him, though. Yeah, he I know. was the kid in class who <laughs> already knew, like, all the different stages of our production. I knew he was going to do production. I know. Wouldn't he, like, wait for you He would class? wait for me. And he had such passion that I was like, you're going to be late for the next class. He didn't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty special guy. We dropped him off at the airport last night. It was so sad to see him go. You know, when they leave, I get really sad for a few days. And now the second one's going off to college in a couple, couple of days. So it's really hard for me. You know, I just wish I could sort of live near them and spy on them and see what they're doing and have coffee with them. But you can't. You know, you got to let them go. But you're right. That's what he was like, too. He thought he wanted to be in front. He ended up behind. So you're passionate about your cooking, about your your people that you're that you're working yeah. with. Yeah. And what do you do in your free time? You're married to that that nice husband of yours, John. <laughs> we had so much fun. Went to dinner. That was really a, we had a good time. Travel. I travel a lot because my husband's company requires him to travel. So fortunately, he likes me enough to bring me along. No. <laughs> and my dog. I think I spend way too much time with my dog. I would say a lot of my free time goes to my little puppy. You're living the life. You're well, doing great. I just think that if you're passionate, you can you can wed your passions. You, you don't can. have to just do one thing. And you can find it and you can find it online. There's always always a way to do that. So yeah. I'm just glad you came here and hopefully that inspires people to call you about what you're doing, to do their own thing, whatever, and then go to your restaurant. When are you heading back to New York? Uh, soon, uh, for Sunday. He leaves Sunday. on Sunday. And I oh. do want to say one thing to everybody. If yeah. you do have a parent who cooks, honestly, even if this never came into a book, spend some time with your parent in the kitchen and work side by side because as somebody who didn't get to spend too much time with my dad when I was a kid because he was working so hard, forget about the book. It's the memories that I'm creating with this man that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. So I tell everyone, I, all my Greek friends who have their moms, I'm like, learn Spani Kopita, learn it, and just spend time cooking. And if it's not cooking, that's your passion. Whatever your parents love to do, just just do it with them because it's, it's the best thing, I think. I think that's it. Whatever your parents love to do, do it with them. It may not be in the kitchen. You know, It might just be going for a walk and whatever it is. Whatever I mean, it that's is. Because there will come a day when you may not be able to do that, and I know that all too soon. So um, thank you for being with us. Thank it was a you. really, really fun time. Thank you. Can't wait to go see your play. I'm going to be in New York uh, so for the excited. marathon. I hope I can even walk. You have afterwards. to come to Monty's seat beforehand. Oh, you know so I'm going to do that. I will <laughs> do that. We will have to sort of set something up because I'm going to be there beforehand and after, so we'll do that too.
They fill you up with some pasta because it's yeah, good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you do this what people do the night before, right? Yeah, the blue, yeah. Yeah, c kind of. If I do that, I might go into a little bit of a food coma for real. <laughs> so I have to, no, for real. So I have to sort of balance it. Balance but we'll it. figure that out, and I will come there. Yes. Thank you for joining us. This was so much fun. Anyway, thanks, guys. See you next week. Another fun edition of Deborah Cobalt Live and a little Italian music to, to, uh, to end the show. Did I surprise that on you? Sorry, Tony. I, I always do this. I surprise the board ops. I'm like, hey, what about some music? They're like, wait a minute. So, That's what keeps you fun. Yeah. Make sure he's not falling asleep yeah. on me, right? You know what? I love that song, One Meatball. Did you ever hear that? No. One Meatball. Oh, my God. By Victor There's a song called Pastore One Meatball? or something. Oh, my gosh. Do we have One Meatball? One Meatball? Oh, my gosh. Please find One Meatball. Are we still on? Like, is my face on? or? Yeah. I, I can't, I'm like yelling about one meatball. <laughs> Do we have one meatball? <laughs> I don't know. Do you have one called one? There's one right there. What does it say? What's what's his name? Every one meatball. That's kind of it, but that's not the original. <laughs> he could afford but one. Okay, I guess I'll take it. That's not quite the one I would listen to, but, you know, we'll, we'll just keep looking until we find the one meatball. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. The simple dinner.